Hebrews chapter 10, 23, 24, and 25 are the three verses we're going to look at today. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23, 24, and 25, and we're going to talk about how important church is. Now, you're going to say, now, wait a second, I know it's important because I'm here, and that's awesome. We do need to know that that's why you're here, and yet at the same time, how many times have we talk to people and they'll throw out something like, well, you don't have to go to church to be this, and you don't have to go to church to be that, and you don't have to do this to do that, and how many of us have a really good answer that we can give them at that moment, and today you will. Uh, as well as to reinforce to us today why it is so important to us. Uh, so before we go any farther, draw near to God, and this is the second half of the message. We talked about drawing near to God last week. This week we want to talk about drawing near to God together, community, together. Read with me verses 23, 24, and 25. It says, let us, now right off the bat, the writer of Hebrews is not saying let you. Have you ever heard somebody uh, speak or teach and they're saying, this is what you ought to do. This is what you ought to do. Now, this is what we ought to do. Let us. And so right off the bat, he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Now, when he's saying here, hold fast, it means together, in community. Not us individually, but individually, corporately. Let us individually, but let us corporately. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. It is going to make this transition of this is what we think that this is what we should do because this is what we think. And so we talked last week that this entire thing is from going from just having a set of duties to a set, set of dailies. Something that I want to do every single day. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he, and the he there is Jesus, for he who promised is faithful. And then let us consider how to provoke one another. Now this word here for stir up uh, in the English Standard Version, the word stir is not in there. Uh, we put that word in there to make it make sense in English, but it's only that word up. And, and so it says, but it's the word in the Greek that means provoke. Now when was the last time somebody provoked you? Or should I ask, what provokes you? People who play too slow on the golf course. I've actually hit my ball into the crowd in front of me. Now, you're only supposed to have four people on a, on a foursome. And a, and I've played on golf courses where there have been like four carts playing the same hole. Twelve people. And, you know, and they're all putting out. And all of them are four putting. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They deserve to be hit into. <laughs> they're asking, they're begging me to hit into them. First of all, I'm not that accurate. So if I hit into them, they go, hey, what are you doing? I said, lucky shot. I can't hit that accurately if I try, but a lucky shot. So he says, let us provoke one another. It is a very strong word. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Let us provoke one another to do what? Love and good works. You see, most of the time when I think about people who provoke me, love and good works is not the next phrase that comes out of my mouth. <laughs> let us provoke one another to love and good works. And then take a look at verse 25 with me. And let us not neglect. Some people might say, uh, do not neglect or do not put away. Let us not neglect the meeting together, as some are already in the habit. When he says the son is in the habit, remember this church is going through persecution. It is a church probably somewhere near Rome, within 60 miles of Rome. Uh, it, it is going through the Nero phase of the Roman Empire. And so uh, they are losing their businesses, they are losing their houses, they are losing their ground, they are losing their family, they are being forced out in every different place, and the one way that they could uh, prevent all this from happening is either to say, I no longer believe in God, I no longer believe in Jesus, I'm no longer a Christian. They could just denounce their faith, or they could keep it so quiet nobody knew. And so some of them quit going to church just so the persecution would stop. Now let me just say, that we've got to ask ourselves many times, who do I want to please? Do I just want to please the government? Do I just want to please the people who wants to make the world secular? And remember, the word secular does not necessarily mean evil. It just means take any and every form of religion um, and, and those kinds of morals out of public life. So it's not that they want to be amoral. They just don't want Christianity, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, they don't want any ism to be talked about. Secular means completely religion-free. They just want to make the world completely secular. 
And, and so in so doing that then, uh, how do we witness? How do we live for God? How do we let others see our good works in public and glorify our Heavenly Father as the Bible commands us to do? It says, so we can't neglect or forsake the meeting together as some are already in the habit. Now this doesn't mean you can't go on vacation. This doesn't mean that you can't uh, uh, have a really terrible night and, and forget to wake up on Sunday morning. Uh, we're talking about the person who makes a habit of missing church. And, and did you know that most habits are started on purpose? They become a habit, but they're intentionally began. I decide I would rather go to the ball game. I decide I would rather do gardening. I decide I would rather go fishing. I decide I would rather, and then you, you say, well, it won't hurt just once. And then it's so much fun you want to do it twice, and then the next thing you know, everybody's wearing a bow tie. <laughs> Habits begin as a desire, and, and they start off. So let us not become habitual neglectors of worshiping together, but encourage one another. How can I encourage you if I never see you? And how can you encourage me if we never see each other? And that's why it is so hard when we go to multiple services. You know, uh, many of you don't see the people who come to the second service. Believe it or not, there's about 100 people that come to the second service. And, and we still have too many to just go back to one. I will say that uh, about two or three months ago, when we were in the early service, it was down to 10 or 15. And the second service was at 50, 60, 70. I was thinking, you know, maybe I should talk to the elders about coming back and just having one service. Just going back to one service. And then all of a sudden, we jump back up to like this morning. We have 45 or so, 30, 45. And then the second service, all of a sudden, we have 100 or so. Uh, and so we know that we can't do that because on any given Sunday, if everybody was to come, there wouldn't be enough parking spaces and there wouldn't be enough sitting spaces. Could you imagine coming to church and being told, sorry, we're full? Now, I've had that happen when I go to the theater. Anybody ever go to the, see one of those movies and everybody, and then all of a sudden say the, the movie is sold out? And there's a great big line of people and it's already sold out. And people will stand in line for a sold out movie, but people won't stand in line to come to church. I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. So let us not then forget that we need to come and encourage one another all the more as we see what? The day approaching. Now remember, you should look in your Bibles and that word day is capitalized. Anybody notice that? And, and so and even more, and we could read it this way, that we should be coming together, habitually meeting together, encouraging one another, even more as we see the dawn of Jesus' second coming. Come. We should be seeing all of that. All right, let's go on. Verse 23. Hope is to be held on to. Let us hold fast the hope that we have, the confession of our hope. Uh, uh, did you know that the world that we live in is filled with hopelessness? There was a professor at New York University by the name of Marston, and he went around in New York, not just in the secular uh, colleges, but all around New York, and he asked everybody one question. The question was this, what have you to live for? So if I was to ask you this morning to grab one of those green cards and write on that green card on the back side where it says prayer request, if I was to ask you, what have you to live for, how many of us could just start writing, boom, 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 just start writing? 94% of the answers received in this particular survey simply getting through to the day. No hope for tomorrow, no hope for retirement, no hope for grandkids, no hope for graduation or paying off student loans. The, the, the biggest thing, 94% of the people said, I just hope I can get through today. If I get through today, that'll be enough. Now, uh, but we have something of better substance than that. Now, I, when I underline the word we, I am saying Christians. And we meaning if you're here and you are also a Christian or people are watching on YouTube. And believe it or not, we YouTube the early service. And by the time the second service comes on, as many as 10 people have already watched our first service on, on YouTube. Uh, I can't believe it. Uh, uh, it just humbles me to know that people uh, right now maybe might not even have a church to go to. And, and believe it or not, you're their church. But they're turning on our station knowing that they can find the word of God. We, if we believers, we Christians, we have something that the world doesn't have. And at least 94% of those who answered that question is missing in life. What is it? 
But in chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we were given a precursor of what the profession of hope that we have is. And we have an anchor. And we have an anchor for our soul. A hope that entered into the inner place uh, in heaven. Not just into the synagogue in Jerusalem, but he went into the very throne room of God. And he walked into the very throne room of God, not boldly or brashly, but as a sacrificed lamb risen again. And able to take away the punishment and the penalty of all sin. And he walked right through the curtain of heaven. And he sat down at the right hand of God. And he has been the anchor of our soul. So our anchor is not in the bottom of some ocean. Our anchor is anchored to heaven. And what is one of the purposes of the anchor? To keep us from drifting. Drifting. Now, there are many times when I go fishing that I don't put the anchor down. I want to drift over those spots and just let my, my hook over. How many of us have ever gone deep uh, or snorkeling and or scuba diving? I was scuba diving, again, back in Devil's Lake, Wisconsin, and I was in the bottom of this ocean, life of environment, and I saw a lure go by. Now, we had all these buoys up that said divers. You, you know, if you're familiar with this, you got to put up a buoy, and you're supposed to stay within 50 meters of that buoy so that you don't get snagged by a fisherman. Everybody got it? And I see this lure go by, and I see this fish looking at this lure, and the fish looked at me and goes, isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever seen in your whole life? <laughs> and so how many of us have been hooked by sin and have somebody else look at you and go, really, you fell for that? You see, we need to be anchored. And as sin seeks to drift through and over your life, we need to be anchored, but not tethered to the bottom. We need to be anchored to heaven. And that's exactly what our hope is. Let us hold fast our confession. Who is our confession in? That Jesus Christ died on the cross. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ is living, ever intermaking his intercession for us in heaven. And the day is coming when he comes back. And beloved, it could be today. That's what our confession is. Did you know that the anchor on a ship is the most important piece of equipment did you know that they will put out to sea, a ship will often put out to sea with sometimes a faulty motor. They will put out to sea sometimes with a faulty steering mechanism because you can always make adjustments with the motor and, uh, uh, and the steering and put the motor in reverse and the steering the opposite way and you can still jockey the boat around. But a ship's captain will not go out to sail because when he says when all else fails, I have to have an anchor. And let me just tell you, when all else fails in life, our anchor is sure too. But our anchor doesn't look like the anchor of the world. Our anchor looks like this. We are anchored in heaven through the cross of Christ. Let's take a look at verses 24 and 25. He goes on to say this, then let us consider one another. Uh, did you know there are a million reasons to stay away from church? If I was to ask you right now, uh, uh, what do you have to live for? You might find very little bit to write down on your paper that you're really living for. Uh, yeah, but if I was to write down, what are some of the reasons why people miss church? I bet you we could get a list. I mean a long list. And it might start from persecution, but it would probably go all the way to laziness. You know, there's a joke about that person that woke up one morning and he just says, I'm not going to church today. I'm just grouchy. I'm irritable. I don't feel like going. And his wife said, but you're the pastor. <laughs> there are, they just tell you, all pastors are human too. And so uh, it can go anywhere from persecution all the way to laziness. But there are a million different reasons. But here's what we want to concentrate for the rest of this morning. Why we need the church. Why we need the church. And let me just remind us again. It is the church, this building. And so the church is what? It's us. Why do we need each other? Is really what we're asking. And the first one is called ontology. Uh, anybody ever hear of ontology? If I was to just say, well, what is the definition of ontology? Somebody would probably say, it's a branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of how things be or being. Somebody else might want and said it's a set of concepts and categories in a subject or a domain that shows the properties and relationships that they have between them. How many of us are thoroughly confused? And so now what we want to do is say, what is biblical ecclesial ontology? 
And what is that? That is coming together in Revelation 1, 9 through 20. In Revelation 1, 9 through 20, it says that Jesus is walking through the church. And in one hand, Jesus Christ has seven scars in his hand, and he is walking among the seven lampstands. And the seven lampstands we know stands for the church. And so he says, where you meet me the strongest is in corporate lampstands. Where I am the most dynamic. That, can we be out fishing and catch a fish and say, pray in the Lord. Let me just say, when I catch one, I do because they're so few and far between. I say praise the Lord. And, and I'm a catch and release kind of person. I want to give somebody else that same thrill. And, and so, uh, but Jesus walks through the church. And Jesus encompasses our worship. Now the Bible says where there's two or three gathered together, I'm there uh, amongst them. But there is something special in a special meeting of God. How many times have you been to women's ministry uh, uh, event and there's two, three hundred women there and you just say there was something so, in so inspiring about that worship. You know what it was? It was the pure numbers. Pure numbers can spark that in a church. How many times have we gone to youth camps and the youth come home and they say, you know, it was just, it was just so much better at camp. Well, the music wasn't better, and I was the preaching, so the preaching wasn't any better. What was it? We were together in a, in a mass group. And when we are together, there is corporate power and passion because we are the church. We need to get together, but we also need doxology. Now, what is doxology? Uh, it comes from two different words. It means the study of doxia or the study of glory. We glorify God, and we learn how to glorify God in church. You see, I'm sick and tired of watching people on television, especially during this terrible hurricane, telling me what the church ought to be doing, who don't go to church. I am tired of turning on the television and hearing somebody on television say, this is what the church ought to be doing, and this is what this church ought to be doing, and this is what this church ought to be doing, when they don't go to church, they profess, they don't believe in God, they have professed. They don't care about God, they have professed. But they have become experts on telling us what we're supposed to do to glorify God. Where should we learn how to glorify God? Right here. In our Sunday school classes, in our Bible classes, in our youth classes, in our women's ministry classes, in our kids' church classes, and in corporate worship. We need that. Martin Luther said this. This is a great quote by Martin Luther. At home in my own house, there is no worth or bigger in me. Could you imagine that? Now, let's just be honest. How many times when we get home, we just get tired? And after a long day, there's no longer any worth or vigor left in my life when I get back in my own home. I just want to, but, he says, but in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire breaks out. Kindles my spirit and my heart. It breaks its way all the way through my lack of worth and vigor. Uh, when we come to church, it ought to be a celebration every week. A celebration. So many people come to church saying, all right, let's hear what you got. We should be coming to church saying, let, let me find somebody I haven't seen in a while. Make sure I rekindle that relationship. It needs to be a corporate study of the glory of God and a corporate celebration of the glory of God. We need theology. You know, if I was to tell people that I'm going to start a long series and I'm going to preach doctrine, uh, really? We're going to do 12 weeks on doctrine? But you know what the doctrine means? It means this is the way God's Word has taught us how to know Him and relate to Him. That's important. How many of us, if we ever met someone like maybe on eHarmony, or match.com. And the first thing it does is it says, all right, this person is like this, and this person is like this, so how do we take these qualities and tell this person about these qualities? They get a great big list of your qualities. Guess what the Bible calls that? Theology. It's a list of the qualities and characteristics of God. And if we want to be in, in spiritual e-harmony with God, we need theology. In Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, it says this, that we may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints. Now let me just say in that passage in Ephesians that we've already read today, I have read through that passage several different times in several different commentaries, and each one of the commentary people believe this. It doesn't mean that each one individually, it means that we learn how to become strong, and we learn how to comprehend when 
all of the saints are with each other doing it. It is a corporate strengthening because individuals have come to the thing that they need most, and that is church. That they would be able then to have surpassing knowledge so that when you leave here, you're better able to go back into the world and tell them the answers why there's 94% who says they have nothing to live for. Theology is to be done in assembled churches. Now that doesn't mean you can't study theology on your own. But let me just say this, I don't know how many times uh, I've had to take a look at some song titles and say we can't sing that at our church. Because a person sitting there in their own little room thought up their own little funny little ways to say things. And, uh, and guess what? When you put it down, there's verse after verse after verse. It says, you know, that's not exactly accurate. So theology is learned corporately where we can say, where in the Bible does it say that? So when I asked Pastor Darrell this morning, where in the Bible does it say that we are supposed to wear ties as pastors? It doesn't. It does say to present yourself as someone who is leading the congregation. And that historically in America has been suits and ties. And so we're just going on that past. And there's a lot of people that on the days that I wear a tie, they'll look at me and they'll say, well, you look nice today. Because they are so used to Pastor Brad. They are so used to Pastor so-and-so. They're so used to Grandpa so-and-so. Uh, pastors in Virginia wouldn't even think about showing up without a tie on. Right? And so, if you don't wear the tie, but there are some churches today, as Pastor Darrell reminded me this morning, that the pastor is the one with the biggest holes in the jeans and the biggest earrings um, on their ears. <laughs> and for that particular congregation, that might be exactly what they need, but we need to remember that theology is not done by the clothes we wear, but the words that we are taught out of the Word of God. And theology, like ontology and like doxology, needs to happen in church. What about psychology? What about psychology? This is not what I want to say. This is not the sense of the study of the psyche or the soul. We are not talking that the church needs to come together so that we can study the, the, the concepts of the suke, as the Bible would call it, or the soul. But it is the development of the soul. Theological ontological, doxological, psychology is the development of your soul. Let us consider how we can, without wavering, how to stir one another up, how to provoke your spirit. And let's face it, your spirit is partly your soul. Did you know that the Ten Commandments, the first four of the Ten Commandments, are all about how we are supposed to relate to God? But the last six are all about how we're supposed to relate to each other in community. Now you would say, oh no, that's the nation of Israel. But the nation of Israel was nothing more than a big picture in the church. It was a big chip because it was, this is how you should worship in community. This is how you should camp out in community. This is how you should do sacrifices in community. So the whole nation of Israel was 12 tribes living together under one God. We are we believe in one God, and we are going to work as a community of worshipers. It was nothing more than the nation of Israel originally uh, coming out of the Sinai Peninsula was supposed to be one big church. Now, one may develop, now let me just say this, a, a person may develop faith and hope, but even that's questionable on their own. But you can't learn to love on your own. It takes somebody else, it takes community to grow up your spirit into love. So let us consider how to spur one another, provoke one another onto what? Love and good works. The, the psyche of the soul, the building up of the soul. How do we do that? It takes community. Did you know it takes someone rubbing you wrong to, for you to learn how to love anyway? It takes friction to learn how to love. Uh, Believe it or not, there's a lot of friction that happens at the church. And we should be leading the way in what? Experiencing friction and producing love. Now, we should not be provoking people just so we could say, to point out their lack of love. We should still be provoking them on. How do we provoke them on? And so it says, let us then consider how to provoke one another. 
We do that through prayer. I sure hope that you will take seriously. I, I really do take seriously all the prayer requests. Many times Karen will get them all written down. She'll send them out to us in emails. And we pray here on Tuesday nights. We've got Bible study on Tuesday nights. But the first half an hour to 45 minutes of our Bible study time is just doing the prayer requests and praying. We close it in prayer. So we'll have maybe an hour and 15 minute study here on Tuesday nights from 7 to about 8.15. And we'll have maybe 15 or 20 minutes of Bible study. The rest of it's all prayer. We need to be praying for people. But I want you to catch this. Not just by problem, but by name. We, we'll say something like, well, I remember Ann has a problem about something, so be about that problem. And David's had a problem with something, so be about that problem. And, and Karen has told us about a problem with somebody else, so be about that problem. But uh, Sometimes all we'll remember is a problem. All right, there were two cancers. There was uh, one cyst on a kidney. There was one perforated and herniated intestine. And one polyp erupted in a gallbladder. Now, you know what we used to call those in the church? Those were organ recitals. <laughs> we need to be praying for people by name, not just by problem. Because God can take care of problems, and how does he take care of problems? By dealing with what? People. We need to be praying for people. We need to be examples. Now, Jim Elliott said this, I am willing to give my life to be an example for people who have never seen. And even if it will cost me my life, I would rather give my life as an example for Jesus with people who have never seen them than to just sit in a pew and just sit there. We need to be examples. Um, we need to be loving God as and serving mankind. And the, one of the greatest ways to provoke one another is to is, and stir up one another is be the example worth following. There are some commercials right now on leadership. And leadership is not getting someone else to do it, but someone else who will do it with you. That's leadership. We need the Word of God. We need to provoke people with the Word of God. So that when, uh, when we stir them up, we can say, remember the Bible says. Remember the Bible says. Remember the Bible says, has faith. God is not forsaking you. He will never forsake you. God has promised he will never give you something beyond your ability to handle. But with that, we'll also provide a way of encouraging you and a way of escape that you might be able to endure it. Provoke one another around with the word of God. M and M to M. Meditate and memorize to minister. And let me just say, you will have a very difficult time doing ministering if you have never meditated and memorized. Because you'll say, I, I think it says somewhere. Ah, I don't know, maybe. But, or then all of, our, all of our psychology of ontology and theology of the soul will be based on humanism and human answers rather than on the word of God, rather than on the examples of Jesus, and rather than on the prayers of the saints. We need to be meditating and memorizing to, to minister. We need to encourage each other. You know, in a world that is just seems like it has just gone out of its way with trash talking. And did you know that sometimes trash talking can be funny, but most of the time it's only funny to the person who's not being trash talked about. In fact, if there's a crowd and this person's talking to this person, other people go, oh, that's a good one, oh, that's a good one, oh, we got you there, oh, we got you there. But what if you're the person consistently being stabbed? We need to be encouraging. We need to be, uh, as it said, we need to be considering one another. And then if I know what Carol's going through, then maybe I can be praying, Lord, give me something that will encourage her so that the next time I see her, I can say something that will lift her spirits because I have been praying about Carol, not the problem. And finding the answer to her problem in memorizing, meditating, to minister from the Word of God so I can actually encourage her. There was a person by the name of Robert Menard. Uh, did anybody ever hear of him? Great writer, journalist. And one day he walked up and there was brand new cement on the ground. And he looked around and there was nobody around. So what does a young boy want to do with brand new cement? Write his name. So he finds a piece of wood and he starts to carve his name and all of a sudden there's a shadow over the top and he looks up and there is a great big man standing right behind him. 
And he said, why are you ruining my masterpiece? He said, well, I just want to put my name in there. He says, what do you want to do with your life? This is what this man said. What do you want to do with your life? And he said, I, I want to be a writer. He said, then put your name in books where it belongs. Don't put it on the street in the gutter. Write your name where it belongs. Write your name in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. May, may your good treasures, including the good reputation of your name, may it be written in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. He, he said, don't write it on the gutter. Put it in a book. Put it in a poem. Write your name in a place that it is reputable. And Robert Menard in his memoir says this. As he walked away, he saw the man get down and start to trowel his food. And he looked back and the man shook the trowel at him and he said, Write your name. If I ever I could encourage you, do something that God will write your name in glory. Not just in the street of the world or, or in the epochs of time here. Because this world is going to pass away. But heaven and the word of God will what? Never pass away. So uh, write your name. Do something. Right? Help someone get their name written in a way in which they will always be, always remembered in the ear of God by the voice of Jesus. Let's bring it to a close before we go to communion. We must draw near to God. We must draw near to God together. We must hold on to the anchor, hold fast to the anchor of Jesus Christ. We must devote ourselves to corporate worship. We must provoke one another to what? Love and good works. And if we will do all of this, we will discover that we are better together than we could have ever been on our own. Now that's something I say at every wedding that I do. That the two of them should come together because they will find out that when you are married in the name of Jesus, that they will be better together than they could have ever been separate. And what is the analogy of us, the church in Jesus, is what? A wedding. Because with Christ and with one another, we will be better together than we could ever be individual. Doesn't mean you can't worship, but we will be better. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, now as we prepare our hearts for the reception and the consumption, help us first of all receive whatever it is that we need to receive to deal with if there are any sinful activities inside of us so that we would take this in a worthy manner. And then may we remember again, consume again, the death, burial, and resurrection and the coming again of Jesus Christ. Could we have Pastor Darrell, would you go ahead and continue this prayer, specifically by remembering the Holy Father? Father, thank you.